So for starters, let's talk about what is a security context constraint. To understand that, what you need to realize is that when a container runs a process, it prevents the process from being able to access certain protected Linux functions. These are things like being able to access shared file systems, being able to run as root or as a privileged container, being able to access certain Linux commands such as the kill command. By default, a container doesn't allow a process to perform these kinds of functions. And the reason why this isolates the container, if the process could do these sorts of things, it could do things that affect other processes and you would lose container isolation. So the container is doing its job. It's containing the process and isolating the containers. The question then comes is what happens when an application needs access to some of these protected Linux functions? Usually most applications don't, but some do. And when that happens, how do you do it? Well, here's basically the process is that the pod that runs the container is going to configure a security context which specifies the access that the application requires. The pod is also going to specify a service account that is able to authorize that additional access. Then the project that the pod is running in is going to use RBAC to associate the service account with an SEC. And the cluster is going to configure that SEC and it's going to have permissions in it, the one specified in the security context. So here's what a security context does is it's a feature in OpenShift that authorizes permission to access these protected Linux functions. And the important thing to realize is that ultimately the cluster administrator creates the SEC and associates it with the with the um, security account so that the cluster administrator has complete control over which pods are allowed to access which protected functionality. The cluster administrator can control all of that. So how does that work? First of all, you have a developer that creates an application that needs access to some of these protected functions. Second of all, you have a deployer who creates a deployment manifest for deploying that application. And that deployment manifest is going to specify two things, a security context, which specifies the access that the application needs, and a service account that authorizes that access. That's going to get associated with an SCC, a security context constraint that was set up by the administrator. It can be a predefined SCC that is built into OpenShift, or it can be a custom SCC that the cluster administrator wrote themselves. That SCC is going to be assigned to the service account, either directly or indirectly via RBAC. And then ultimately what's going to happen is when the scheduler wants to start the pod, admission control running in the cluster is going to decide whether or not that pod can be created and started. And what it's going to do is it's going to compare the security context to the security context constraints and decide whether or not to allow the pod to be created. When the pod is created, if and when the pod is created, then the pod will configure the container as described by the security context, thereby allowing the application running in the process in the container to access those protected Linux functions. Here's an example of what the pod manifest looks like, is that pods are typically deployed inside of a deployment. So here's an example of a deployment. And what you can see here is that this part in the middle, this security context is specific for this one container. Whereas this security context down here at the bottom applies to all the containers in the pod. So there's actually two ways of setting the security context within the pod spec. The other thing that is set in the pod spec is that the pod specifies the service account that is going to be used to authorize this. So this is the part, this is the deployment manifest 
that the deployer writes to specify how the container is going to be deployed into the into the cluster. And let's notice that what it's doing is it's saying that this container is going to be able to run as user one two three four and as group five six seven eight. Those are not the defaults for the way a container is normally run inside of OpenShift, but that's what's going to happen here. Also, that this container is going to, and any other container in this pod, is going to have access to these other um, file system groups and other groups. And they're on the, all in the range of 5,000 something. So that's what the deployer specifies. What the cluster administrator specifies is a security context constraint. And here's two of them side by side so we can compare them. The one on the left, is the restricted one that is built into OpenShift. The one on the right is a custom one that we've written for this example. So the one on the left over here, you'll notice it doesn't allow you to do much of anything, that everything is turned off, capabilities are all null. In fact, some cap capabilities are specifically dropped so, so you can't allow them. And even the, the user and group stuff is, is fairly restricted. So it's not gonna allow the container to do anything but run with, with the default permissions the default Linux capabilities, which is fine for most cases. But in some cases, you need to do more than that. So then you do, you either specify a different predefined SCC or the cluster administrator writes a custom SCC like we're showing here on the right. This one on the right says that the user can be any user ID in the range of 1,000 to 2,000. You'll notice that in the pod uh, security context, we said that we want the user to be 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, that's in the range of 1,000 to 2,000, so that's great. Then we say that the group must be in the range between 5,000 and 6,000. Well, in the pod spec, we said that the group should be five, six, seven, eight. That's within the range. And we specify a couple of other groups that we wanna have access to. Well, those are also in the 5,000 range. So that works. So this custom SEC will allow that pod spec to be deployed. An SCC can specify three different types of permissions, or there's three different ways that it can specify permissions. Those are privileges, access controls, and capabilities. So privileges are, can this container run as a privileged container? Access controls are, what user and group can this container run as? And capabilities are specific Linux functions and whether or not you're allowed to run them. So normally you're not allowed to run kill and change owner and, and that sort of thing. So you can specify those capabilities to allow those. A way to envision the relationship between a security context and an SEC is that it's like a, a key and a lock. That the security context, let's notice here in this example, it's probably a little bit hard to read because the text is small. But the application is saying that I need to be able to do an action that we're gonna call P2, permission two, just an arbitrary name. And I need, and the application needs to be able to perform another action that we arbitrarily call P5. So in the security context, we specify that the application is gonna require P2 and P5. That's the key part of the relationship. Then the SEC is like a lock that says, I'm gonna allow keys with, with, with certain teeth in it to, to be able to work correctly. So this restricted SCC, all it allows is something that we arbitrarily call P7, permission seven. The main thing that's important here is that it doesn't allow a whole bunch of other permissions. It doesn't allow any other permissions, including it doesn't allow P2, doesn't allow P5. So this SCC will not allow this security context to deploy. So it will not allow this application to run. Now here's the same application in pod again, same application, same security context, but here's the custom SEC, which allows P2, P5, and P7. Well, the security context needs P2 and P5, so that's good. It doesn't need P7, so that doesn't hurt anything. It doesn't, it's not necessary, but it works. So this SEC will allow this pod to deploy because the pod requires P2 and P5, and the SEC allows it. So it's the same pod in both cases. The thing is the first SEC blocks the pod, the second SEC allows the pod. 
here's a way to look at what's going on inside the cluster and inside of OpenShift is again, first of all, outside the cluster is you have the developer who's developing the application that needs access to protected functionality, same as before. Second, you have the deployer who's going to create the deployment manifest that, among other things, is going to specify the security context, saying that these are certain permissions that the application needs, and saying that this is the um, that this is the um, service count that is going to um, authorize the permission to to set those permissions. Now, meanwhile. The cluster administrator separately develops an SEC that allows those permissions, associates it with a role, and, asserts, and creates a service account in the project and associates that with the same role. And now this service account in the project is associated with this SCC in the cluster. The cluster administrator has done all that, so the cluster administrator controls all that. Now with that in place, when we deploy the pod into OpenShift, then deployment is going to associate the pod with the service account, which is already associated with the SCC. So then when we go to start the pod, the admission controller is going to decide whether or not it's OK to start the pod. The admission controller looks at the permissions in the security context and compares those to the permissions in the SECs. And as long as all those are allowed, then it's going to allow the pod to deploy. If any of those aren't allowed, it's going to block the pod from deploying. If the admission controller allows the pod to deploy, then when the pod creates the container, it's going to configure the container in the same way that is described in the security context. And then that is why, why the container is going to allow the application access to that protected Linux functionality.